Imagine for a moment that you are not yourself. It's not the year 2021, you don't have a cell phone, there's no such thing as Wikipedia, there aren't even textbooks. It's the year 1667 and the invention that's going to turn the world upside down, the steam engine, is still decades away. As you sit in your laboratory with your eyes fixed on the roaring hearth, you wonder, what is fire? As the flames leap, you think about the alchemical transformation that's happening before you. Where there once was fresh, dry wood, you know at the end there'll be nothing but ashes. Not only will matter be transformed, but it'll have lost something vital, for ashes no longer burn. Your thoughts wander to other substances that burn. Candles, metals, sulfur, all examples which become inert after the passage of flames, as if something has been lost, dissipated into the environment. And then there's the fact that pure iron can be regenerated from rust if heated in the presence of charcoal. It's as if the substance in the charcoal responsible for the flame is what regenerates the rusting iron. Now, your mind is racing. It's clear that the ability to burn is due to the presence of a flammable element, an obvious integral part of all combustible substances. When it escapes, it leaves behind remnants of what was. Ash, soot, rust. Satisfied, you think to yourself, I shall call the invisible fire-giving fluid phlogiston, Greek for burning. Of course, you would be completely and utterly incorrect. Despite this, your theory enjoys immense popularity for nearly a century before falling to Lavoisier's chemical theory of combustion, shortly before the guillotine falls on Lavoisier's own neck during the French Revolution. But that's probably a story for a different day. Today's video is all about the ways in which magical fluids are an integral part of the way humans come to understand mechanisms in nature. By the end of this video, you will understand that incorrect yet popular scientific theories are a feature, not a bug. So buckle up, because we are about to explore how the battlefield for greater knowledge is littered with the bodies of magical substances, and how there are plenty of everyday phenomena, from electricity to energy itself, that fall prey to the siren call of the magical fluid. To really get to the bottom of this, it's worth explaining what we mean when we say magical fluids. These are bespoke substances that have been created specifically to explain an observed phenomenon, but fail to provide a robust physical mechanism. We've already talked about phlogiston as a failed explanation for fire, but there was also the caloric as an explanation for heat, miasma for disease, and the four humors to explain health and well-being. These substances were all attempts to explain the natural world, but carried inherent contradictions. Escape phlogiston was responsible for the oxidation of metals, but oxides are heavier than their metallic counterparts. The flow of a substance called the caloric was proposed to cause heat, but limitless amounts of the substance could be generated by friction. Infiltration of miasma into the body was thought to cause disease and contamination, but then there were some individuals who never developed sickness even in the presence of bad air. Eventually, all of these substances were rationalized. Logiston fell to chemistry, caloric to the mechanical theory of heat, and miasma to microbiology, immunology, and nutritional science. What makes the replacements so valuable is that they do not require an exceptional magical substance that can do the impossible like giving an object mass by leaving or seeding life in a vessel without it containing a biological seed. However, the progress toward a consistent physical mechanism didn't always go smoothly. For example, when Lavoisier addressed the many contradictions inherent in the phlogiston proposal by replacing it with oxygen chemistry, he inadvertently introduced a new magical fluid, the caloric, a substance which carries heat. Obviously, this was incorrect, as we now know heat to be due to the frenetic movement of molecules. But what's truly devastating to the pursuit of scientific knowledge is that even though Lavoisier's description of heat as a fluid was off the mark, it was sufficiently useful to be used in the design of the first theoretical heat engine. This is a theme that persists to this very day. If some scientific theory is sufficiently useful in technological applications, there's little incentive to reevaluate the details. This is well illustrated in electricity, where the mismatch between drift speed of electrons and the propagation of current has been known for decades. There is a discrepancy of 11 orders of magnitude between the two measurements, a finding which was addressed by the Drude model in the early 1900s. The model suggested that what propagates isn't the flow of electrons, but a front of movement caused by electrons colliding with one another. 
and transferring momentum across the length of the circuit. However, there are problems with this idea. Transfer of momentum solves the question of current speed in a circuit, but it doesn't completely match observational data in alloys or at low temperatures. The subsequent Summerfield Drude model, also known as the free electron model for current flow, solves the problem by replacing ping pong ball electrons with a delocalized quantum gas. While this solves some of the original Drude discrepancies, it too suffers from problems with predicted versus measured electric behaviors like temperature dependence of conductivity, magneto resistance, orientation dependence of the conductor, and semiconduction. All of which are outside the scope of this video, but let us know in the comments if it's something that you'd like us to explore. In the meantime, if you're interested in knowing more about the strangeness of the way that current behaves in a circuit, check out the podcast where we have some conversations lined up. The link for that is down below in the description. For right now, what's important is that the current understanding of current is incomplete, as there's no single theory that applies in all conditions. But just like with the caloric theory of heat, it works well enough for engineering, as is evidenced by the enormous pace of technological progress in electronics. Up next are some concepts that aren't exactly fluids, but still seem to rely upon magical substances that defy understanding. Light was originally conceived of as the flow of particles from an illuminated source. Then it was considered a wave in a special etheric fluid. Today it's thought of as a fundamental particle of the boson variety, but it's also a self-propagating wave in an electromagnetic field. But a field, as defined by Feynman himself, is a, quote, physical quantity which takes on different values at different points in space. So that means that an electromagnetic field is a set of changing measurements, and light is a specific kind of change in those measurements? But what is actually changing? A measurement requires that some thing's motion be measured. But quantum theory basically says hypothesis non fingo about what that material substance responsible for this motion actually is. So demystifying light will require understanding a material basis for fields rather than just leaning on a mathematical summary of those measurements in place of mechanism. Gravity has similar problems. Newton refused to even begin to address the cause of gravity, while many others, including Descartes and Lesage, attempted to explain this mysterious attraction to be, like light, the flow of etheric fluids. Later, Einstein offered warped spacetime as a replacement mechanism. But as with the electromagnetic field, spacetime isn't actually a material actor capable of causing an effect. It's a set of dynamic positions with particular effects occurring at those locations, and so doesn't actually explain why there's pull, just that it's measured to be so. There is immense hope among particle physicists that a quantum explanation for gravity is on the horizon, but it will take some serious phlogistication to explain how a dimensionless particle is capable of mechanical pull. A symptom of our failure to grasp a physical mechanism for gravity is the invention of the dark dyad, dark matter and dark energy. According to astronomical observations, the edges of galactic disks contain less mass than the galactic center, as evidenced by the fact that the center is much brighter. Therefore, at least according to Newtonian mechanics, the outer edge of the galaxy should rotate slower than the center. Observational data, however, shows that galaxies rotate much faster than expected. To rescue the galactic rotation problem, astronomers invented a magical substance, wholly unique in the universe, called dark matter. It pads the mass of galaxies around their edges, allowing the math that predicts rotation speed to work out. It's also thought to account for something like 85% of the mass of the universe. The only problem with the theory is that dark matter is completely undetectable. This is a substance that's been invented for the sole purpose of preserving the extant mathematical architecture for gravity the very definition of a magical substance. Dark matter's sinister cousin, dark energy, is a similar just-so story as it's an effervescent force that repels gravity and allows for the expansion of the universe. It patches up inflationary models of cosmology by producing the repulsive force that's necessary to prevent all matter from collapsing in on itself. And just like dark matter, it's never been observed directly. Then, the term energy itself can also sometimes fall into the bin of magical fluid. Sure, it makes a lot of sense in terms of physical momentum. Something material in motion can be thought of as energy. Like, molecular motion makes perfect energetic sense. But in a wider context, the word energy is one of the most abused concepts in the entirety of science. Ever since Joule formulated the relationship between mechanical motion and heat, energy has been considered a characteristic of a system. 
However, in the subatomic world, we're told of ionization energy, nuclear binding energy, and chromodynamic energy. Each of these energies binds some part of the atom to the rest. But how can an idea like energy serve as a material actor capable of structurally securing anything in the atom? I mean, houses are bound with nails and mortar, not energy. Why should we accept the atom as an exception? All this isn't to ridicule those who would come up with magical fluid to explain something fundamental. It's all about demonstrating how, at the edge of human knowledge, it's really difficult to actually explain what's happening, and often many processes in nature do appear fluidic until a more detailed conception becomes available. After all, mathematical formulas describing various transport phenomena, whether that's the transfer of mass, heat, or energy, share some serious parallels to those for fluid momentum. All of this makes magical fluids an inevitable step on the path towards scientific explanation. In the initial stages of discovery, we tend to produce somewhat supernatural explanations. They get us down the road a little bit. Imperfect models have worked well enough to innovate engines, metallurgy, to work out the principles of thermodynamics. But eventually, we're going to need a real physical mechanism. What complicates matters is how difficult it is to replace popular theories. This has always been the case. Ask Galileo, Pasteur, Margulis, McClintock all people who were told they were crazy wrong before anyone came around to their way of thinking. Some of this has to do with the fact that science is really, 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 really hard. It requires having a lot of knowledge, time for immense focus, an alpha nerd level attention to detail, and more than anything else, the willingness to be wrong over and over again. Explanations are also affected by the fact that the very definition of nonsense is deeply cultural and relativistic. If the community believes that magic, defined here as inexplicable actors or actions, has a useful and reasonable place in theory, it becomes extraordinarily difficult for an explanation without supernatural actors to be accepted. The robust immune system of the scientific community is a double-edged sword. On one hand, it demands rigor and tenacity, on the other, it contributes to stagnation. All this despite the fact that nearly every theory that's ever been proposed has been incorrect to some degree. The central role of science in society hasn't really crystallized until now. It's created a massive pressure for theories to be correct, as they're used as the basis for making important decisions about the future of the planet and the species. Contradicting the status quo requires A, having an extraordinary scientific reputation, and B, being willing to risk it all. Even if one has extraordinary evidence and powerful rhetorical skills, politics are mandatory. And yet, from history, we can all rest assured that magical theories will be turned over eventually, given enough time and attention. So what will it take to topple the remaining magical fluids of science? We can take a leaf from Lavoisier. He spoke before the Royal Society against George Stahl's phlogiston theory, and at the very start of his speech, before he pointed out all the contradictions and began to take apart the theory, he made a simple request. Quote, I beg my readers to shed themselves of all prejudices as far as possible, to see in the facts only what they show, to banish all that reasoning as assumed, to transport themselves to a time before Stahl, and to forget for a moment that his theory ever existed. The goal of this channel is to find the places where there are runs in the tapestry of science, to point them out, to pick up the thread, and to make a new attempt. Like we said at the beginning, Lavoisier's replacement for phlogiston was only partially correct. While he was right about the relationship between oxidation and combustion, he made a lot of other mistakes, not limited to the invention of the magical caloric. And that's the case with lots of today's science. We have many explanations that are better than they've ever been, but even those will eventually warrant reimagination. We hope you will join us on that journey, guided as it is by Lavoisier's assertion that, quote, it's a good principle of logic to not invent a new fluid if it can be explained more simply in other ways. If you like what we do, Consider hitting us up on Patreon. A few dollars a month, if you can spare them, will get us down the road to make more cool stuff for you. Coming up on this channel, we have episodes about troubles with interpreting history from Earth's crust, why the Earth is shrinking, and illusions in risk assessment. If you have other topics that you would love to see us do episodes about, drop us a note in the comments, come find us on Facebook, or join our Discord. Till next time, humans, when we will see you right back here at the edge of what is known.